Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, so my name is Dr. Mata Haggis. Uh, I'm the head of game design and production at a university called NHTV. Um, I teach on a course called IGAD, International Game Design and Architecture. Uh, and if you want to follow me on Twitter or anything like that, my name is at Mata Haggis. Mata, M-A-T-A, Haggis, like the Scottish food. Yes, I know it is a silly surname, but that's the one I was given, so yeah. Um, I'm going to be looking at my phone occasionally because I've got some notes about what I want to go through this uh, today. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about a few different topics, but it's all about the idea of how we teach uh, about diversity and awareness of queer lifestyles uh, at my university. So I'm just going to have a sit down, and uh, we'll get ourselves going here. So, uh, a little bit about myself to start off with. I've been involved with uh, equal rights campaigns for about 20 years. When I went to university, uh, I was very much a part of the LGB society, which then became in later years LGBT, and then later years became LGBTQ. Um, it's very interesting to see over the last couple of decades the increasing awareness of diversity issues uh, among many people. Uh, and it's lovely to see over the last few years a, a, a growing awareness of this. I've been working with games development for about 14 years now. I've written stuff for TV, I've worked on a few major titles. I was an indie developer for about seven years, uh, running my own little company uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, for about seven years working on sort of flash games, a uh, little bit sort of animation for television. Part of the thing I've always tried to get through is awareness of social issues. So there might be a little bit of interest in kind of corporate culture and how that can be a positive and negative thing, uh, awareness of different issues of sexuality and how people present themselves. This is something that's been going on uh, through my life for a long time now. Um, I then, after doing a little bit of that stuff and doing a PhD, my PhD was about gender and identity. My bachelor's degree was about finding a bisexual theoretical perspective. So there's a lot of stuff about queer theory at the time which was very interesting, but queer theory at the time basically was just gay theory, uh, which is cool, don't get me wrong, there was a lot of really interesting insights coming through there, but there was, it was quite limited in that perspective. Queer theory really was just looking at homosexual relationships and how it was presented in culture. So something I was trying to do with my bachelor's research, as many years ago, uh, was trying to broaden out this perspective. That went through into my PhD, which was looking at gender and identity in the work of William Gibson which is very much looking about how technology is, use, is being used in literature to manifest identities in different ways and how that's changing how we look there. Uh, I went through into the main, mainstream games industry where I worked as a designer on Burnout Paradise, dri driving game, came out a few years ago. Uh, and I then moved into uh, Rebellion where I worked as one of the main writers on a game called Aliens vs. Predator as well as being uh, sort of the lead campaign designer for the Marines campaign in that. Um, I'm quite proud of the work I've done. There are things we could have done better. There's always things you could do better. And I look back through my history and I occasionally kind of go, ooh, that bit, maybe we should have done that better. One of the really interesting things about um, the awareness of diversity that we've had over the last few years is really made us think much more carefully about how our choices are influencing culture. So that's part of what I'm trying to teach him at my university. My university is NHTV. Um, we have a games academy. It's been running for a, nearly a decade now. Uh, I'm currently the head of the design and production course. I'm going to be moving more into research over the next few years. Uh, but one of the things I really want to get uh, integrated is this kind of diversity agenda, making sure people are aware of this, and hopefully making games that won't do any more harm to culture than we already have being done on a daily basis because uh, we will all be aware that there's a few problems with the world. Um, the Dutch government, NHTV is based in the Netherlands. I've come from the Netherlands to be here, so hi. That was a long journey. <laughs> it, it's a really stupid time of the day in, in the Netherlands. Uh, so jet lag, yay. That's going to make me slightly excitable. Um, so the Dutch government is really pushing for people to be a lot more aware of diversity issues and ethics Business, business ethics and responsibility towards society. So at the moment, I do teach a course which is about ethics um, and games development, which isn't as much of a contradiction as you might think. There is ethics in games development in some places, but there's still a lot of people who have issues with these kind of ideas. As they think of the, the business model of trying to have diversity awareness as being as absolutely in contradiction to their own existing business model. 
Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, if you look at the ESA statistics, you see 48% of gamers are female identified. That's pretty interesting as, as, as a statistic to come out there. Uh, you look at some of the surveys that are being done. The usual numbers people say is about 10% of people in the world are gay. But if you look at some of the surveys being done, you've got uh, these kind of double blind tested kind of surveys where they, uh, previously they've gone anonymous surveys, and you come out with a number about 15 to 20% of people have had some sort of gay experiences in their life. The most recent ones where they're not actually saying, have you had a gay experience, they're saying, so, you know, you're a, you're a man, have you ever kind of fancied another guy? You looked at him and gone, yeah, he's, he's actually pretty sexy. And you're actually finding that there's a lot more numbers of people who've had something that you might consider a non-mainstream, non-heterosexual experience in their life. And that's more like 30, perhaps even higher percent. So there's a lot of awareness, these kind of things coming through in the research side of things. Um, and so there's something that the Dutch government is very keen to make people aware of and, and helping us get these kind of things into the curriculum. At the moment, the course I teach only actually goes to about the quarter of the students that come to my university, well, to my course at the university, IGAD. We're currently teaching it to the designers and producers. People are going to go through, they're going to be making decisions about the world that the game is going to be in, the mechanics the player is going to use, and the people who are controlling the budgets and helping making sure that the team have all the resources they need to get through. However, in the next couple of years, we're going to be moving this course out into being taught to everybody, the programmers, the visual artists, the audio team. Everybody's going to be getting this, this same sort of training. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through a little bit how we do this and how we get people to be on board with these kind of topics. Because, like most of the world, uh, and like most of the games development world, most of my students are white, straight, heterosexual kind of males. Um, not all of them, of course. And we're getting an increasing number of women involved, we're getting an increasing number of people from different sexualities, um, different gender identities, uh, and different nationalities involved here. So we're getting some really cool stuff coming, coming through, people of color, it's... We're in a Dutch culture. It's fantastically open and very, very welcoming. We've had a couple of transgender students over the, over the years. We may have had more that I wasn't aware of, but there are a couple who have talked about this with me. Uh, and we're very supportive of having as many people kind of come in and have their voices and their stories told. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through a little bit how we get this into the curriculum. There's this co topic we have, which is called Society and New Media. Obviously, as media developers, interactive entertainment developers, uh, we need to be aware of how our products can influence society. So what we do is on a week-by-week -week basis, we talk about different topics. We talk about uh, violence in video games. This is obviously a topic that comes back into the news very frequently. Grand Theft Auto is obviously one that comes up quite a lot here. Um, we do talk about things like the Columbine High School Massacre, where people talk about kind of blamed doom for making people violent. Ah, it's, an, it's a topic that we get quite uncomfortable with. And obviously one of the things we come through with in this course is really these ideas that there's not this kind of black and white, true and false kind of idea about many of the, these ideas. A lot of the research has actually been completely um, ambiguous about whether video games really do make you more violent. But if you ask a lot of games developers, if you ask a lot, a lot of people on the internet, and there's a lot of people on the internet, they'll say, no, they don't. They don't make you violent at all. And you ask any journalist, and they say, it's a great story if we have it saying that they are. And if you ask people on the street who don't play games, they'll say, yeah, games make you so violent. That's kind of interesting. Uh, there's a lot of gray areas kind of coming out here in presentation to society. So we need to ask students to be aware of these kind of things. Now, after a couple of weeks, we look at things like violence, addiction. Are video games art? That's the question that keeps on coming back that we need to think about. Now, one of the questions we get to eventually is, are video games sexist? How do video games um, become aware of diversity? How do we treat people with different backgrounds and different lives? Queer lifestyles, how do we do this? So one of the ways that, we, that I approach this is we have, uh, I split the, the, the lecture. There's two parts to this course, a lecture and a debate. I'll tell you about both these parts. To start off with, in the lecture, we split it into two pieces. To start off with, we look at, for about half an hour, sexism in games content. This is a topic which, I'm, for the very fact that you're at this conference, you're probably fairly aware of how this works out. We look at um, the sexualization and the objectification of women in games. Uh, we always get those kind of topics coming up going, but men are sexualized too. They've all got six packs and broad shoulders and muscly and 
I kind of go, yes, but let's look at historical perspective. Let's look at how these things are different. So we use these kind of points as a launching pad for discussion. Rather than me just standing up there going, this is true, I try to always encourage the students to think about these, to question these, uh, these ideas. So the second part of this, and the part that uh, takes a lot longer in the lecture, is where I present four ideas from modern feminist theory as critical tools. Uh, I, I'm not presenting these things uh, as, you have to believe these are right. I go, here's some ideas which are quite powerful. Here's some ideas I think are really interesting. I'd like you to think about these and engage with them. Uh, so by letting the students engage with these topics by themselves on their own time, we tend to find it's a lot more powerful way of teaching. Rather than, uh, this, we're moving into an idea of kind of project-based learning or problem-based learning. We give the students a problem. Here's a thing which is considered problematic. How do you analyze that? How do you understand whether it's problematic or not? What tools, what features of the world can you use to analyze this kind of content and see where the problems might lie? So the four things that I introduce to them, of course there are more ideas that we could go with, but the four things I talk to them are these. We talk about privilege, microaggressions, victim blaming, and tone policing. So obviously privilege uh, is a term that many of you are probably familiar with, but I'll quickly go over it. This is the idea that um, some people are born with or have, through their life, got to a position of power or, th or authority. But one of the main things about privilege is a lot of the people who are in these positions are not aware of their privilege. And that's often where some of the biggest problems come in. So you have the con consistent sort of thing of like, why is Gamer X even necessary? Why do you need to identify uh, this kind of tiny little group, how specific do you have to go? Is it, I actually saw a, a post on a discussion about GamerX, which was like, yeah, okay, so you're looking at gay people who play video games. Are they also Mormons who uh, dress with their left leg into the trousers first? How specific do you need to be to make this tiny little conference for this tiny little group? And it's like, well, if you think it's a tiny little group, maybe you're just not aware that actually this is a lot of people. Maybe you're not aware that the lives of these people, these people need to be recognized, and they need to feel validated to be members of society. And as games developers, games producers, you really need to be aware of this because you're in a role where you are in the position of power to either validate these lives or consider them irrelevant. So we talk about these acts of privilege. Now something I'm gonna get onto in a moment is my privilege. Now, I'm going to be sitting there telling people about these ideas and these, these, these privileges that you have uh, as a person, and I've got a hell of a lot going for me. So that's something I'll talk about in a little minute, because I want to talk about some of the problems that I face while teaching these kind of things, and issues that if you decide to try and use any of these strategies yourself, that you may come up against. So microaggressions is one that a lot of students, it's a complete revelation for them. There is a website called microaggressions.com where people are just cataloging, and a few people are nodding here, they, it's a really cool website. If you've not been to microaggressions.com, strongly recommend looking into it because it's a real eye-opener to a lot of people about how a lot of different tiny parts of their life become a big problem. So rather than saying microaggressions are bad, if you say bitch all the time, this is denigrating to women. And even if you're using it to a man, it's still denigrating to women. If you say it again and again, if one person here's that all the time, then that's not a problem. Uh, well, that becomes a problem. That is, these things mount up. And people are very unaware of how things mount up over time. Uh, so I use an illustration where I kind of have a slide on the thing and go, hey, you've got a really big nose. And the person goes, yeah, I do have a really big nose. It's true. Uh, so that's, that's yeah, fair enough. Um, and then I kind of go, and then later in the day, somebody says to them, hey, you've got a really big nose. And the person goes, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do actually, yeah, somebody else pointed that out. I've got a big nose, yeah. And then I point out that maybe at dinner time, someone comes up to them and goes, hey, you've got a really big nose. And the person goes, yep, yeah, I do. Good, well done, you've, you've got eyes, congratulations, well done for you. And then it gets to time, they're going out for a drink in the evening, someone comes up to them and goes, hey, you've got a really big nose, and you go, fuck off. I've had enough of people saying that. So the person goes, whoa, whoa, it's only a joke. And I've said big nose, but actually I meant you've got really big breasts. And everyone in the room goes, oh, right, yeah. Because if they've heard that four times that day, or if they've heard that 100 times that month, or 300 times that year, 
suddenly that tiny little joke, that tiny little comment, oh, you look a bit like that. Hey, you're that Chinese guy. Do you know that Chinese, other Chinese guy? God, why would I? For fuck's sake, have awareness of the people. Have awareness of the things you're saying. Now, one of the things I always have that students say to me towards the end of this lecture is usually, do you mean I have to be careful about absolutely everything I say? As if this is a ridiculous thing that you should be aware of other people's feelings at all times when you're talking. As if that's completely impossible. And I go, yeah, you do. And they go, oh, I wasn't expecting to say yes to that question. The idea that you have to be aware of people around you at all times. And sometimes you're going to make mistakes. And if you make mistakes, listen. Ask politely, with respect, what you've done that caused the problem. This bit seems to be the bit that really hits most of my students hard. This idea of microaggression is incredibly powerful. And if you have people who have issues with this kind of stuff, that, that you see this happening around you, or you want to teach other people about these things, microaggressions is a really important tool to teach people about. So the next one I'm going to go on to is victim blaming. Um, from its very essence, uh, this is a difficult one to teach about. Um, victim blaming often is related to incidences of sexual assault, uh, and obviously the most powerful versions of sexual assault, which I don't want to talk about too much, because for the same reasons it's difficult to talk about in a lecture, I don't know your personal histories. Um, I've had a couple of un uncomfortable experiences for myself in the past. They fortunately did not go too far, but this is one of those things that's very, very serious. And if you're going to talk to people about this, especially with people you don't know their personal history, you have to be really, really careful. So what I say to my students is, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a few tweets about some in incidents of sexual assault. Now, if anybody in the room wanted to close their eyes, you can do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my back, and I'm just going to flick through these. And if you have your eyes closed, I'm not even going to know you've got your eyes closed. I don't, if you feel too ca careful about this, I don't want to know. You can come and talk to me a bit about this stuff afterwards if you want to, but I don't want to do anything more. And I turn my back on the audience and I flick through the slides, and you can hear people gasp as they see the horrible things people have said about victims of sexual assault. The victim blaming, the, oh, were you drunk? Oh, what were you wearing? All these kind of comments that I'm sure you guys are familiar with, you've seen these turn up on the internet all the time. They're terrible, terrible things people say. And letting people become aware of these kind of issues, aware that this happens around them, is a very powerful thing for people. But you have to be very, very careful when you're teaching this kind of stuff. You don't know who's in the crowd. You don't know what's happened to them in the past. It could have been yesterday that something bad has happened to them. If you look at the incidences of sexual assault, I think it was 25%, if not higher, of women of college age, not even older, college age in America have been victims of sexual assault. This is pretty serious stuff we're talking about here. There's a lot of people this stuff impacts on. But there's this very little bit of awareness about how this is uh, a problem for a lot of our people around us. And there's great insensitivity towards these issues. So this is something that I talk about um, with my class, but it's something I have to be very, very careful with. Uh, and I let people know when those slides have gone past so they can open their eyes again and I move on to the next part. You have to be so careful when you're doing this stuff. The final part, and probably the most difficult part of this for people to get and to get on board with, is the idea of tone policing. Now, tone policing is um, when people who are either very good-willed towards diversity or sometimes when they're kind of more trollish towards diversity, they kind of go, in, oh, why do you have to be so angry about that? I'd listen to you if you weren't shouting. It's not my fault. It's not my personal fault. Why do you have to be so angry? Why are you blaming me? Ah. See, the thing is, I, like I say, I've been involved with equal rights and equal rights awareness and diversity awareness for a very, very long time. Um, I have been, I was having a discussion with a kind of second wave feminist, which was kind of 1980s to 1990s. Uh, feminism, and there were some issues in there I'm not that comfortable with in the way that feminism was presented back then. I absolutely am so happy to stand in front of you and say I'm a feminist now. 
I'm well up for diversity issues. This is a fantastic movement. But there were some problematic parts in there. Um, and I was called by a second wave feminist in a polite discussion. I said, but you are a man. You are a rapist. Yeah. Uh, I, that's one of the nastiest things you can say to a human being outside of pedophile, murderer, um, bestiality. These, these are pretty strong things you can say to a person. Rapist is on that list of terrible, terrible things you could accuse another person of being. But it was a, it was, it was a deliberately provocative statement to start a discussion. Um, there, this was part of a general discussion about feminism, about masculine and feminine, feminine traits and behaviors in society. It was a very civilized academic conversation, but it was an incredibly strong thing to say to someone. And I tightened up inside. That's, a, that, that's the most abhorrent thing that a person could say to someone. And my instinct was to go, why are you doing that? That's a horrible thing to say to me. But another part of my head kind of goes, OK, I see you're saying this for a reason. I see you're saying this for a reaction. And, and the lady speaking to me, Yes, we were trying to have a civilized conversation. Maybe that wasn't quite the appropriate thing for her to say. But equally, she feels it's valid to st uh, a valid way to start a discussion. Personally, I'm very uncomfortable with that approach. But I've seen some very angry things on the internet, things that are so furious with men or so furious with the way they've been treated, so furious with being bisexual and how the gay community is treated a bisexual. Or so furious that you're bisexual and straight community has been horrible to you. Or gay people and transgender people. Some of the things that, oh man, I've got a friend going through the, through the transition at the moment. And some of the things he's been through are awful. And all of these people have an absolute right to be fucking furious the way they've been treated. They've got the absolute right to this. That's their personal life. Their life story is something that's driven to them to that point where anger really is the only sensible reaction for these people. And then if you say to them, don't be angry, you're, you're, you're hurting my feelings. Wow, how insensitive could you possibly be? But then I think back to when my friend in an academic conversation has called me a rapist and I kind of go, wow, that felt really difficult to respond to that. And my students have a great difficulty with this kind of idea that when somebody else is being angry, they should try and be calm and listen and find the reason for it and find the points for it. Not go, oh, why are you so angry? Listen, pay attention, find the reasons for it, and try to understand the reasons for their anger. Try to understand that maybe that person is going to say something that they might not normally say if they're thinking about it more carefully, but they have the right to be angry. They have the right to say things which are extreme occasionally. It's a really difficult one. And I think, judging by your face in the room here, you're probably all sitting there going, I've seen that. It made me uncomfortable as well. But I also see that those people have a right to be angry. And respecting the rights of others to be angry, there is a time for anger in all of our movements. There's a time for passion in all of our, in all of our movements, in all of our discussions. These things are there. And sometimes when life has kicked you too many times, Anger is a valid response. It's a tricky one. This is the part that my students struggle with the most. So if you want to talk about tone policing with people, really think about carefully how you're going to go about doing this. It's a really powerful idea. It's a really important idea. And it's something that I've only really been getting my head around. Literally, in the last six months, this idea has come up more often. Um, so these are new ideas for me sometimes. But I think it's really important to talk to younger people, especially um, about these topics. Now, when I went to university, that was the first time anybody talked to me about feminism. Nobody had really discussed this stuff with me. Uh, and as an educator now, I think it's our responsibility to talk to younger people, to talk to people who've not necessarily had these conversations before, uh, to try and make them aware of the most powerful ideas that are coming through uh, about equality, about diversity. And I'm just about being able to have a sensible, sane conversation. Uh, and if somebody kind of goes, you know what you just said was really offensive? Just listen. This is one of the funny things. So when, I was, when I was talking about this, um, issues of sex in games came up. Uh, and I was talking about, uh, we came up with kind of, there are certain expectations in games. 
Uh, and I mentioned kind of those expectations might be different in Japanese culture, in Japanese games. And all of the cl class laughed. And then I suddenly went, wow, um, sorry. I've actually just been really stereotyping the Japanese. I've been really stereotyping Japanese culture, this whole kind of tentacle porn type thing, the, the schoolgirl outfits and the sexualization of young women that sometimes happens in Japanese culture. I've been really stereotyping that, and that's not a nice thing that I've just done there. I'm really sorry, I shouldn't have done that in front of you guys. Um, and that wasn't a setup, that was a genuine mistake. And we all make mistakes, and the important part is to be aware that we make mistakes. Think about what we're doing, apologize for what we're doing. We can even do those in front of crowds when we're trying not to. This happens, but the important thing is to bear in mind that we do it. Listen to people's objections, try and have that self-awareness and the, the humility to own up to it to realize that we're just people growing and trying to form our opinions and trying to, trying to be good people and positive people, and sometimes we're going to fuck that up. And that's not a good thing, but if we can take responsibility and ownership for our own mistakes, then we can grow and be better and try not to make mistakes, those mistakes again in the future. So that's a big part of kind of what we go through there. Now, there are some challenges with this. Um, what we do next with this, so I give a lecture, which is great. We give people tools. Uh, I say these are really interesting ideas. The biggest part of the week, though, we spend two hours forming a debate. So what I do is I split the, gr the group into two groups, and we have a debate topic. So an example might be uh, that, is, that it is not the responsibility of games developers to change society to improve diversity awareness. And one half of the class will argue for this being true. It's not the responsibility of games developers to do this. The other half of the class will argue that it isn't true. It is the responsibility of games developers to be responsible for changing society's views. I also get a small group of, of students with me who are going to be the judges of this debate. What I do is I give them a little bit of time to research, and they make their argument as strongly as they possibly can, and the other side makes their argument for as strongly as they possibly can. All of these debate topics, there is a gray area. Is it our responsibility? Is it not our responsibility? Now there's a huge market for games that are not responsible in terms of diversity awareness. But then again, if you're exploring new fields, if you're exploring new topics, now there is actually a whole business area here that maybe we should be aware of. And as people who want to shape society, as, as media creators, we need to think about these kind of ideas. We need to think about these influences that we're having. So there's a big argument to be had on these both sides. And with the judges panel, I sit there and we talk about the debate topics and the, the presentations that both the students have been making, going, oh, that was a really well-made point. That was a really well-made point. And what you find is at the end, usually at the start, both groups have kind of got a fairly strong opinion on one side or the other. Even in debates like this, where we, where we as developers might kind of go, yes, it is our responsibility to change the world. There are students on both sides of this debate. But by researching, by hearing other people, hearing their peers, making strong, well thought out, well researched uh, opinions on both sides of the topic, usually in the end they kind of go, this is much more complicated than I thought it was. There's actually some really strong arguments on both sides of this. I should think about this some more. And this is a way of letting students get ownership of these topics. I could stand there and talk to them for two hours on this topic. I could stand there and say, well, there's the business side of this, there's the social side of this, we have responsibility as developers. But until they gain ownership of that knowledge, until they think about it themselves, internalize it, see how they would discuss this with other people, they're never really going to take ownership of those kind of ideas. So that's really what I do with them. I really help them get these ideas into their own head and think about them and move them around a bit and use these, use these ideas of diversity awareness, these, these ideas of microaggressions and how... You know, one game with, a woman, with women in bikinis, that's not a problem. 20 games may be becoming more of a problem. If almost every game is sexualizing a woman and objectifying them, and they're always a particular type of woman, they're always going to be a slim woman with a bare midriff and boob armor, um, and that's the only vision that people are seeing of representation of femininity in a game, that becomes this kind of microaggression idea. It builds up to be a larger negative thing. And that understanding of just one incident, maybe that's not a problem in itself. 200, 500, 700 games came out in a year, 
and only 15% of them, oh, sorry, 15 of them had a female protagonist as the main character. Now there we are going into something quite interesting. A few more of them had optional genders, optional sexes. Almost none of them have any tra anything transgender. You begin to see these representations of femininity and you see the, how these things could accumulate to be a problem. And each individual one, not necessarily a problem, but using those microaggressions, applying these ideas into debate topics, suddenly these ideas, they see where these things are coming through. Now, those are all pretty good. And the student outcomes of this are incredibly positive. What we find is the, the designers and the producers who've gone through this course, they go to their teams and go, you know what we're doing here? That's not so great. Maybe we should think about this more carefully. And we find some of the other students who haven't gone through this, I, these ideas are kind of going, no, 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 that's just fine. It's just a game. <sighs> yeah, it is just a game, but microaggressions. Think about how these things build up. Think about these kind of ideas. Think about how these uh, sort of responsibilities that we have to build these things more. Um, think about how your privilege as a games developer, and yet once again in your game you've made a male protagonist, yet once again you've made it a male white protagonist, yet once again it's a male white protagonist who's going off to save the woman, or he's getting revenge for his family being killed, who are all a daughter and a wife. Yes, once again we... Oh, well, hang on, that's Watch Dogs. Um, but you see how, as developers, we have choices that we can make. There is a broader spectrum of choices that are there. And it makes better games. It makes more interesting games. So one of the classic things you come back from the internet, one of the things that I, it really annoys me about when people talk about Anita Sarkeesian's work is, you think this is so cool. Why don't you go make a game yourself about it? So I did. Um, but the thing is, one of the things I teach in this is that you should listen to the words people are saying, not who is saying it. So some people who are very smart say some very stupid things. Some people who are very stupid say some very smart things. And the most important thing is to listen to the words they're saying and not judge the person it's coming from. Think about the meaning, think about the passion behind it, think about the root causes for this, because you will come out with some important stuff. Now, is David Gader a more valid critic of video games than Anita Sarkeesian? It's a tricky one, because David Gator has made some fantastic games. He's done some amazingly progressive things. And he says some very smart things about games. Anita Sarkeesian, she's not a games developer. She's a cultural critic. And she says some very smart things about games. Both of these people are saying equally valid things. But I know who will be listened to most in the games community. They're going to listen to David Gator a lot more because of who he is. Maybe because he's a man. Maybe that doesn't go amiss in these kind of conversations. And that's a kind of interesting thing. So I also try and tell, teach people to be aware of what's being said and who these people are. So some of the challenges that we have here. Well, um, part of it is my privilege. You may have noticed I'm from Caucasian background. I'm a white guy. Um, as far as I know, most of my heritage comes from Europe. Uh, I think there are other parts from South America at some point in the distant history. Ten minutes to go, I'm aware, thank you. Uh, so um, one of the things is I'm, I'm, I'm a white guy. I'm a guy. I'm mostly cisgender, you know. I'm fairly happy and fairly content to be in the, the, the body that I am. You know, a bit fluffy around the edges and a bit <laughs> not always the most masculine of men, but I'm quite happy, basically, with being male. That's okay. Um, I'm middle class. I come from a middle-class family. Um, education is something that I've gone through. It was available to me through my whole life. I have opportunities there that other people don't have. Um, a friend of mine who uh, doesn't even remember telling me this, but she told me this um, when I was 19, and it stuck with me uh, through nearly two decades, uh, was the difference between the, the, the working class and the middle class is the middle class sees that all the doors are open to them. The working class don't even see the doors are there. And that was a really powerful thing she said. I uh, got in touch with her again about four, three, four years ago, and I mentioned this to her last summer when we met up, and she said, I don't even remember saying that. I was going, oh my god, it was such a brilliant thing for you to say to me, just the, the difference that privilege gives to somebody. Um, so, that, so that gave me the opportunity to be educated. Um, and that's cool. Uh, I'm tall. 
I'm six feet one tall. That's quite tall. It's about 185 centimeters, if you think in that kind of term. That's fairly tall. And people listen to tall people more. That's a strange thing. But you watch the presidential debates, and you see, if you look at the stats for did the tallest president, presidential candidate win, you know what? Hey, Americans, you're voting for tall people. It's kind of interesting. Um, about 95% of the tallest candidate has won in the last 50 or 60 years. You kind of begin to wonder whether that's coincidence after a while. You like tall people. Everybody likes tall people. Tall people are seen as leaders. I'm a tall person. That helps me. That's a privilege. Um, I'm a university lecturer. <laughs> that's a privilege. People listen to me more. That's the reason I'm standing in front of you here, sitting in front of you here. Uh, I am educated. I've got a PhD. I've been working in games and, and interactive media for about 14 years. That gives me a certain weight behind my words. Even though it shouldn't, it does. Uh, I'm a native English speaker. Uh, I speak in Kleinbeach in Nederlands. Uh, I speak a little bit of Dutch, a tiny bit. I speak a tiny, tiny bit of French, a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of Italian. I can ask directions in Japanese, but I can't understand the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but every single one of my students is bilingual. And that's a th an advantage I have. And so much of the world speaks in English, this is an amazingly powerful thing I've got on my side. And I can't ignore these kind of things. Um, I'm bisexual. There are parts of my personal life that make me quite happy to say I'm queer. But those things don't come out too often. My partner is female. She's an intelligent, creative, beautiful woman who inspires me every day, and I'm absolutely in love with her. She's wonderful. She's up on fragments of him uh, stand with me. Um, she's an amazing woman, and when I walk down the street, people kind of go, hey, look at the, that lovely couple there. They don't think, hey, I wonder if any of those two are bisexual. So I have this passing privilege, which is great, but on the other hand, I've got also bi erasure going on there. People see a heterosexual couple. And so at the same time as having the advantage of passing privilege, which is a privilege, it gives me rights that a gay couple don't have in society, I'm also erasing my own identity. Every time I don't say to someone, yes, we look straight, but we're actually bisexual. Every time I don't say that, well, there's that little bit of bi erasure going on there. That bisexual identity is disappearing off into the clouds. But these things are a privilege for me. And that gives me interesting kind of advantages and interesting challenges, trying to get these things across. And my vo voice, because of those privileges, because of those advantages, will be more powerful and a more strong uh, voice in games development, in education, in a classroom setting. So I have to be very careful to make sure I don't overrule voices that are not my own. Which in a teaching setting is kind of interesting because that's the point of teaching sometimes. But it's not, but it is, but it's not, but it is. Trying to find that nice middle ground where you have this healthy debate where you can get across good ideas. That's a challenge, that's a big challenge. University structures by the nature have been going on for decades they are sometimes a bit more conservative. Uh, I get listened to a lot more if I'm not wearing a hoodie, if I'm not wearing nail varnish, if I'm not wearing eye makeup. I do sometimes wear that to university. And I'm pretty sure there are some people at university who kind of go, that's a little strange. Some people kind of go, cool, it's matter. That's how he is. But some people, not so much. And you know, if you want to get listened to by the biggest audience, I kind of have to fit in a bit. Hmm, that's not very comfortable. That's erasing a bit of my own identity to fit in and have my voice heard more. That's a challenge, that's a personal challenge. Um, sometimes the very brand feminism causes problems. As I mentioned before, some of the second wave feminism stuff I'm not entirely comfortable with. Third wave feminism is fucking awesome. I'm so happy to call myself a feminist these days, but at some points it wouldn't have been quite so comfortable for me. But there are a lot of people who remember the less comfortable points and haven't really read into the more modern stuff. And so they go, ah, oh, feminist, are you a feminist? Oh, really? So I use the word diversity a lot more. I'd like to use the word feminism more, but I'm aware of the immediate response it gets from people, and it just shuts down the conversation. So I use the word diversity. One of the things we have is obviously uh, being in these kind of public conversations, 
Uh, these things sometimes go into discussions on Facebook. We have a university group uh, called This Is IGAD. Um, we love games developers to get involved with this group. If feminism comes up on there, if diversity awareness comes up on there, some of our students aren't necessarily so diversity aware. Uh, some of them haven't read up on these topics. Now, I'm not saying, as I said before, sometimes I'll make mistakes. I won't be right on everything, but I've done a lot of research on these topics, and I think I'm pretty good on this. Some of our students aren't so much. And so our students are saying things that, if a fellow games developer or a development company might see them, might not make the best impression. Or they, if we had a prospective student looking that, at that conversation, or if, we have a, or if we have a parent looking at that, they might not necessarily make the best impression. And so when these conversation topics come up, sometimes students make idiots out of themselves in public. Hmm. They've got the right to say things. And without conversation, we don't move things on. Education is about conversations and dealing with questions and responding to things. But sometimes those kind of public forums aren't necessarily the right place to do that. One-to-one -one conversations are a lot more powerful. It's a challenge. I'm not saying this stuff is easy, um, but it is a challenge we come up against. So those kind of public conversations. One of the things, the final challenge I'm going to talk about here really is that um, these diversity aware conversations can actually make things worse. Some students have a lashback against them. It actually makes some of the more um, aggressive in their opinion students be stronger in their opinions, more aggressive towards women, more aggressive towards diversity, um, diverse lifestyles, should we say. And that's a problem as well. And as a, if you do this at your university, if you do this around your friends, be aware that some people might get stronger in their opinions. Some people who are quite aggressive, actually, they kick back harder than they were before because they felt awkward about it. But now the conversation's topic there, you're like un un unscrewing a tap. And suddenly all this hatred and bottled up angst comes out. And that can sometimes make things a little bit more uncomfortable. So be aware you're going to have to have better support systems, student counseling. You're going to have to have teachers who are prepared to step up and kind of go, no, I'm going to support you in this. You need to have people who are going to mediate those conversations there. So if you do do this stuff, make sure you're aware that there might be a backlash and some of your students might need more support. So the results are actually pretty good. Despite those challenges, we're getting some really good results there. Our students are getting more passionate about diversity issues. And there's a lot more diversity awareness going on. My university, on top of, this, uh, of, of these kind of back of these conversations, has got its first LGB, uh, actually, it's, we call it the Gay Straight Alliance. But everybody's welcome, LGBTQ, whatever lifestyles, are all welcome to join in with this. And that's the first time for this university this has happened. So this is awesome. Um, we've got some really passionate people on these topics, people with much greater understanding and much greater sensitivity towards the lives of others come through from putting these ideas into education. So if you are in a chance where you can do this in your game studio, in your workplace, in your education, I highly recommend starting these conversations. It can really change things for the best. One of the challenges we're going to have is scaling these debates up to the whole group. That's going to be uh, 200 students per year. Currently I'm doing this with about 40 to 50 students per year. So trying to scale up those debates, that's going to be a challenge in terms of kind of leadership, in terms of teachers who are aware of these topics enough to be able to deal with them in a mature and responsible way. But I really, really think it's worth it. Uh, putting these things into education is absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can talk to me in, in, in the back. Um, you can apply to come to my university, IGAD, NHTV, University in the Netherlands. Um, I'm always happy to talk about these things. You can talk to me on Twitter, at uh, Mata Haggis. Uh, I'd love to get in conversations with this about you guys. If you've got any collaborations you want to do with our university, that'd be brilliant. Please do get in touch. Or if you want me to come across and guest lecture, I'm always happy to do that kind of thing. University exchanges, doing talks on these kind of topics is really where I want to go with this in the future. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. We're out of time. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, you've been a brilliant audience. Cheers very much.